Welcome everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to to teach the class today. Stefan asked me to give a lecture on Ross. And well, welcome everyone. Um, oh, it's my pleasure okay. to, to teach the class today. Stefan asked me to give a lecture on Ross. The good thing is streaming is working. Okay, let's try this again. Um, everyone hears me? Everyone I'm loud enough, so I want this lecture to be interactive. So please, I'm, you know, just a simple guy, just like you. So I'm not scary. I'm not. Uh, just interrupt, ask questions. I will ask questions, and you will answer them. They will be very simple. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, so let's wake up. Um, I will be talking to you about ROS and more, more general about how to program robots. Everyone has programmed something. Have you got experience? Who, who has programmed the C++? Great. Who has programmed Python? Good. Um, who has programmed a robot? All right. Good. Then uh, I hope the first three, four slides are not too boring, but let's, let's, let's get it going. OK, so if I ask you to, um, to write a program and you see a computer like that, uh, you know, simple programs, hello world, whatever. Um, you're already provided with a, a wide range of tools that you already know that are there. For example, you will not go ahead and implement all the low levels like uh, a device driver, um, you know, file system. So you have already a set of libraries that you know you can build on top. You know, if you have to pop up a GUI, there's an API that allows you to specify a window size and whatnot. And if you, um, if you write your, your application, um, you will use all these libraries. And the nice thing is the way this is arranged is such that it, uh, it does not only work on one computer, but it works on many, if all these libraries are ported correctly. Now, in case you haven't asked yourself, why is this? So why, why is this working so nicely? Anyone? OK, the reason is uh, standards, OK? We have hardware and we have software standards. <laughs> I, I can use my mouse and plug it in into another computer, because it, the other computer, also you know, it has a USB port. I can plug in a different monitor in my, in my computer. And um, so we have a set of standards in hardware. And more importantly, we have a set of standards in, in software. If I give you a send you a PDF or a JPEG, you can open it because everyone knows how this file is written and you have programs to visualize that. So now there's a problem, right? If you have a robot, um, so you will see oftentimes robots like these with arms and heads, but this is just general, meaning this can be an underwater <coughs> submarine or it can be an aerial vehicle, though that's not that's not restricted to these kinds of robots. So now if you have a robot, how does it look? The problem with robots, obviously, is, is that they, they look very different. There's, they come in different sizes and shapes. They can fly, and they can walk and, and, and drive. And it's, it's not clear how to define these standards. And so what I'm trying to do today is basically first list the things that you may need in order to program a robot. <laughs> and then basically show how ROS implements these requirements, right? So let's look at a typical scenario. Again, um, I'm obsessed by robots doing useful things. I always think of a robot should go and bring you, you know, an orange juice. That's, that's my goal. That's why I'm doing and did my PhD. So the idea is you have the robot, and what, what are the things that the robot will be have to do? Well, the first thing is it has to perceive, right? Any robot has to perceive the world. Um, there are a set of sensors like IMUs or cameras or 3D cameras or joint encoder readings. <clears throat> and, and 
you know, that's where the problem starts, right? You have a device. And um, if you want to make the robot something useful, you don't want to spend time on implementing the device driver and thinking about the low level details and how this image is being acquired from the camera and then in order for you to process it. At the same time, these sensors are located somewhere on the robot. Okay, um, the problem is that even if, if you build 10 robots, these 10 robots will be different. Um, there's a, there's a, you will need a calibration procedure that allows you to exactly specify or as good as you, you know, potentially can where this camera is. So again, if you have a new robot, you don't want to spend time on implementing device drivers or thinking about how to calibrate these sensors. Next, um, there are a set of um, algorithms that, that everyone has done. For example, if you think of face detection, pretty much everyone that has had a camera and uh, wanted to do something with people has worked on face detection. Now, should I go ahead and implement, again, my own face detection algorithm? Well, the idea is that hopefully I can just pull a package and, and use someone else's face detection and focus on my work. And so there, in this scenario, there's a you know, range of, of algorithms that you may want to need. For example, object detection, object recognition, like post, um, post recognition. Um, the robot needs to localize itself, needs to navigate. It needs to plan trajectories for the arms, and it needs to you know, make decisions whether um, the object is holding is like you know, a fork or not. And so on top of that, um, we need algorithms that do motor control. I guess Stefan has covered um, a set of these uh, problems. It has to do inverse kinematics, where's my hand, how do I have to move my joints in order to reach a particular location. It has to deal with the, the dynamics of the robot itself. And these are all in some sense, textbook knowledge um, components that you don't want to have to implement once you start programming a robot. And so, as you can see in this picture already, there's a, there are control loops. So this is something that um, you will encounter everywhere in, uh, when you program in a robot is there are control loops. And these control loops, they, they come at different time scales. Okay, for example, if I want to leave the room, I first have to locate the door, and then I have to plan, and then I move there. And maybe uh, along the way, I relocate the door a few times. So this is a very slow time scale. But now if, I, um, if I'm walking and I need to balance, I need to compute this the right set of torques that keeps my center of pressure above the, inside the support polygon. If this is a very quick um, control loop, and so I need to do this at a much faster time scale. And so what your um, you know, robotics toolbox should provide is software that allows you to implement both. The, the loose coupling on one end where uh, you can have slow control loops and on the other end, it has to have um, the ability to close very fast feedback loops. So we'll see um, there are some real time capabilities that might want, you might want to use or that you, re that you need because um, for example, we at USC, we have robots that are controlled at a kilohertz, meaning uh, a thousand times a second, a particular function is being executed. Um, so as I mentioned, there is there's need for, um, for this toolbox needs to be able to allow to, you know, for pop processes to pop up, um, talk to another process and it can disappear again, and then at the same time, there needs to be an ability to have um, one process, for example, to close a very tight feedback loop. Okay, I hope this will become clear in a second. Now, another thing is, um, I explicitly asked in the beginning who has, um, who has programmed a robot. Now, from those that programmed the robot, did you program a real robot or a simulated robot? Who programmed a simulated robot? Okay, good. So you guys know the difference. Anyway, so if a new student comes to our lab and we have like $100,000 robots, we are always kind of um, tempted to not give him the $100,000 robot because if he, you know, if he flips a sign, then it's broken and it's sad. So um, what's very important for a robotics toolbox is to provide you with simulations. Um, for both for the robot itself and its environment. And the simulation is, uh, 
is nice because it doesn't you don't risk a break uh, to break a robot. Um, it allows you for debugging because you can basically load a particular state and then it's a very controlled environment and you can redo a particular experiment because in the real world things are always a little bit different. And um, something I will emphasize a lot is um, is debugging. So if you program your regular old program, you have uh, you know debugger, GDB, something that allows you to trace uh, where are sec faults, or you have memory, um, what's it called, uh, while grind to check where are memory leaks. Um, if you're not, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I think at least what you do a lot is you, you write print apps to see where you are in the code and things like that. So imagine you have to program a robot without printf or without any of these tools. So the most important part is um, is to be able to to visualize your data. I will tell show you um, a few ways of how ROS does it. That's that's very very important. All right. So now now how do we go about um, programming a robot? Well, um, obviously, as you said, if you have sensors, we need device drivers. Um, what we'll be talking about is uh, message passing. So you can think that there is a robot that um, you know has um, a whole bunch of processes, and these processes need to talk to each other. So we will talk about how these processes can communicate and how Rust implements them. Um, as I mentioned, we need to be able to lock all the data that is going around in the system in order to debug the system, in order to test the system, and so and so on and so forth. Uh, Ross also provides a few basic, uh, you know, planning and perception and control toolboxes. Um, these are the things that basically implement the theory that Stefan is talking about in this class. At least some of them. Um, I will show the the Ross simulator and um, how Ross is a lot can visualize data and to navigation and extend to uh, real-time capabilities. So in this lecture, I will be basically just flashing all these things that ROS can do and how things work. It's very hard to go into detail in, in you know, one hour. So I, uh, I will provide these slides. There are always links. So all I want you to do is just get excited and follow these tutorials, download code, and, and try to go about, you know, at least maybe start in simulation, but write your own program. And so um, why ROS? Um, well, there are there are plenty of um, other operating systems. It's a, actually a meta operating system um, besides ROS. Now it turns out that um, for reasons I can talk in a man, minute is um, Rust just became a little bit a standard. It's hard to argue, but um, everyone has their own robot operating system. They give them, uh, you know, interesting names. I miss, for example, one is is YARP, and the name of YARP is yet another robot operating system, I believe. At least. So you can see everyone tried to kind of understood the need for a robot operating system, but and tried to push this forward. Now. Ross um, was designed really nicely, and due to uh, the company that was behind it and uh, the money they spent, it really got distributed. And um, you can buy robots, you can buy devices, and on the back of the package you see Ross <coughs> enabled. So you can already see that there is a, a, a large community. Ross has maybe been around for six, seven years, eight years. I have to check, maybe more. Um, and and as I will show, is it's quite is is it is um yeah it's all all over the place now anyone um why should we agree on one standard what's the what's the benefit yeah okay why why is reusability interesting what what what's the benefit okay yeah um exactly so you want to focus on your work, right? And you don't want to deal with all the nonsense that you have, you know, that that has to be in place in order for your research or for your um, approach to kind of um, work. So that's that's exactly the main point. <coughs> okay. 
And um, similarly, one is code reuse, but at the same time is um, is is this this elegance of if you forget your mouse, you can ask me for my mouse. You plug it in, and magically you know it will work with your computer. So if you have one standard, um, it's very important that that if I have some Rust code and it has a set of specifications that are not robot specific, I can provide you with this code and it will work <coughs> on your system. At least that's the hope. Okay, um, a little bit the, about the history. So Rust comes in um, in distribution, similar to how Ubuntu comes in releases. So every half year they change, they they call a set of packages, core packages, a new, give it a new name. It started with, um, I don't know what the first one was. It was Box Turtle, then Sea Turtle, then, then Diamondback. So they like turtles a lot, and uh, they always increment the, the letter A, B, C, D, and um, now it's Hydro, Hydro Medusa. Um, as I mentioned, the idea is that uh, this provides you with services that ex what you would expect from an operating system. We will cover them in this lecture. And uh, the reason why it was uh, so successful is because there was a company that generously um, supported that with uh, employing a bunch of a bunch of people to really push this um, software. And it was um, open source. And well, like everything, uh, things end at some point. So Rilla Garage is no longer really around. So now OSRF is a new, a new foundation similar to, I mean, they basically took over. They have um, funding and, and the support. So again, the, the, the idea of this lecture is that you get excited and you go to these blue links that I have provided and you download and you do ex the tutorials of, for the day. Um, as I mentioned, there are a lot of robots using them. Uh, this is my favorite robot um, that I have been working with. And from what I know, this is the robot that you will be working with. Um, so now the question is, okay, besides agreeing on the standard, how, how does one actually really facilitate sharing? Anyone an idea? Well, the idea is um, the challenge is basically to put your code into little packages. And these little packages have to be just complex enough to be useful for someone, but then just small enough so that people can take two or three packages and put them together and do what they want, as opposed to if you put everything in one big package, well, if you know, if you think of it as a, a kitchen, right? If I have a toaster and um, a dishwasher, and uh, I don't know, a knife, then these are all very useful and reusable tools. If, if all of that would be a toaster that can cut and, and dish, wash dishes, well, if I wanna go camping, I don't wanna take this, I just want the knife. So you have to be, the challenge is, is something that you will actually have to figure out when you write code is how to put these into packages that are useful, self-contained, but then complex enough to be useful. Good. Um, so I'll be talking about packages. A package is nothing but a directory, so don't get um, too excited, okay? So um, in this package, there are a, a set of things that I will uh, list, and for example, in this package, this could be a device driver. This could be my motion planning algorithm. This could be um, a, a phase detection algorithm. And in this package, there are um, a couple of things. One are these nodes. These are these Rust processes. Then there are messages that define the interface from this package. And then there are services that allows you to basically, um, you know, call the service and, and have this process do whatever this process promised you to do. And um, the way the sharing happens is that you put these packages together and for example, a bunch of object detection packages and you put them into a stack. Now the stack is put together in 
a repository, and the repository is what we call the ROS universe. So in order to facilitate uh, sharing, you have this um, decomposition into packages that become a stack, and so this way you can just pick exactly what you want. If the stack is does the trick, you pull down the, the stack, and if you if you need them, the, the smaller components, you take the packages. This just uh, shows that ROS is really catched on, and uh, a lot of places have been using it. One more thing is, uh, who of you has used have used version control systems? Okay, so everyone that has not lifted their hands, I encourage you to look into into start using them. Now is the time. This is has saved my life and is very useful. You should really be considering it. Uh, if you haven't used any, I would start with Git. Okay. Sweet. Okay, so what's inside a package? Again, as I said, there's a package as a directory, and um, here we start with the standard, right? You, you're free to do whatever you want um, with the, inside this directory, but, but think about it in order for you, if, if you have a problem and uh, you, know, you call me or ask your friend and he looks into your package, it's easier for him to understand what you do if you follow a particular standard, a naming convention, a, uh, a way of, of, so you know, if I ask you if, you, if you use this kind of a structure, then I immediately look at your directory and see where to find things because I know where it should be. And so that's, that's something that you will, um, you know, maybe not like in the beginning, but benefit a lot from uh, later. So what, what do we have here? Um, maybe the most important part is, I haven't mentioned that, but ROS um, is not, you know, C++ or Python or Lisp. It, it allows you, to, so there are client libraries in C++, there are client libraries in Python, there are client libraries in Lisp, and in, in even Java or JavaScript. There's a, 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 a bunch of, yes? Oh, okay. There's a, a bunch of uh, client libraries. So I will focus mostly on C++, um, less on Python. Generally, obviously, as you know, if you want to use C++, if it has to be fast, if it has to be performant, if you want to really know what your memory is doing, if you need to do something that is not time critical and you need to do it, fa um, you know, you, you want to rapidly prototype it, then Python is um, is the way to go. So in, in this in this directory, as you have read, there are um, there's the source directories for um, for the, your code, um, the include directories. Um, what we will be talking about is is whatever this message. So actually, at this point, who has used ROS before? Okay. Uh, I'm sorry for those. It will be maybe a little bit boring. Anyway, so there are message directories, the service directories. I will. Hopefully, make clear what what goes in there and what what is, how this looks like. We have um, um, CMake. Ross comes with a build system. It's Ross build or Catkin. Doesn't really matter at this point. Um, and we have an important file which is the manifest. We have a, a directory um, which has the launch files. So think about your package comes with a bunch of processes. In order to start these processes, you usually would you know either click a button or uh, write the, the name of this process in this launch file, it allows you to specify the names of the pack of the process that, that should be started and allows you to specify, let's say, the parameters or the, the arguments of this process. And this this ROS system takes care of starting them in the right order and things like that. Okay, so let's look at the manifest. The manifest is mm -hmm. basically if you get a new package, you can always look at this manifest file and this tells you Ideally, uh, it has, it's an XML file. It tells you what this package does, who the author is, what the license is, and um, what other packages it depends on. Um, I guess this is clear, right? So the idea is if I have a, um, a, a face detection algorithm, my favorite, um, and I have a package that reads from my from my webcam images and broadcasts, or in ROS we call it publish these images. Okay, so I have a package that takes these images and 
sensitive to another process. And then I have another process that implements the face detection that takes this image and tries to find the face. And if it has a face, it, you know, prints face detected. So this face detection package needs to depend on the camera package because it needs to know about um, the size of the, the specifics about the image, right? So if you would look at the face detection package in the mm -hmm. manifest, you will see the pens, the pen package, um, the camera package. And in this camera package, you probably see something that looks like this that specifies where it will find the include files of that library and how you, how you link to that library. So this is basically something that Ross helps you out with nicely. So you don't have to write complicated make files. Okay. Um, so, so as I said, there will be, if you, if you program a robot, you don't want to run this all in one process unless you really, really know what you're doing. You very likely want to have a couple of processes that you can start and stop it as you need. And for these other, for all the processes, they need, you know, the ROS master that tells you, that knows about all the other processes. Okay, and this one is called the ROS core. So the first mm -hmm. thing usually if you, if you start a ROS node, you have to start a ROS core. If there is no ROS core, it will automatically start one. And what the ROS core does, um, we'll see a few examples, is, is the moment in this you know, computer, mm -hmm. there's one process being started, it will talk to the ROS master and say, hey, my name is face detector and I publish images of people that have faces. Okay, so then there's a, another program that says, um, you know, person detector and says, and it comes up and the, tells the ROS master, oh, um, you know, I'm the person detector. Um, and then the ROS master also tells them, oh, by the way, there's face detector um, already online. You know, you can talk to them under this address. So what it does is basically it um, tells, it does the naming service. It tells every process about every other process. Okay, the way the ROS core is implemented is um, is using XML RPC. It doesn't really matter. The important part you will see this when you do the tutorial. It has to have a a a, um, a ROS master URI set. If you don't, it will use a default one, but you may want to specify this by yourself. Um, okay, so now we look quickly at the launch file. It's very simple. It's uh, again an XML file that you can um, execute with a ROS launch with a tool that is provided by ROS. And this is how you specify which node and which package. Um, so in this case, the package is called my package. The type specifies the name of the binary or the executable that you have um, compiled or generated. And in this case, it's node one. You give it a name. This is the name of the node that will be you know, listed if you ask the, the, the ROS core of what kind of nodes are available, and then you can provide it with parameters. So you will see uh, the first thing you probably will do if you program over to you add offsets and parameters and all these things. So ROS allows you to do this um, very nicely. Okay, and as I mentioned, the moment you start a node, it pops up on your system and um, it will specify a parameter on the param server, which is part of the ROS core, and it allows you to have everyone uh, be able to read these values and you can take them and use them in your program. So inside of C++ or Python code. Now, um, now as I mentioned, you will have likely many nodes and the question is, how do you make them communicate? One trouble is this one is C++ and another one might be Python and, and yet another one might be Lisp. So, you know, now you can, you, you get a headache already, right? Because you have to now think about how to do this and how do you make them communicate? And Ross, <laughs> Ross, I think that's, you know, a really big strength of Ross's, uh, yes? Uh, like system of robots. Uh -huh. uh, there is uh, master, one master, <coughs> one Ross core or error exactly. Um, 
Good, good question. Um, I know that in the early days there was a problem with multiple robots, um, but I think now there is, I, I actually, I don't know, but I, I think there should be one raw score. Um, so the nice thing is, um, but thank you for the question. I will try to answer it and, and hopefully answer it at least at the end. Um, so this node, I didn't mention where this process has been running, meaning this node can be run on this computer and this node, this process can be run on a separate computer and they still need to talk to each other. For example, as you mentioned, there's uh, two, three different robots. So the nice thing, the way it's implemented is using uh, sockets. Okay, so even if all the processes are on one computer, they talk over sockets. Now, the nice thing there is if these processes are on different computers, they can still communicate over network. If you have a, an Ethernet <coughs> connection to that other computer, you may want to use TCP ROS because it, you know, establishes a connection and ensures. But if you have, um, you know, aerial vehicles, you may want to consider using UDP ROS so that, and, and do the, the, the error handling on your end. It, so, okay. I, I have to check whether you would need one or, or multiple, but I think it should be just one. Now, in order to make these messages pass, um, that be sent and, and receive, you have to go through a serialization and deserialization process. And, um, or marshalling and unmarshalling. And the nice thing, the way the people at ROS, the, the, the guys that develop ROS is, you can define these messages, okay? So I, I told you in this message directory, you can write simple text files, okay? And for example, in this case, I have an integer field that is data and I have a string and that is name. It's nothing complicated. They have a, a set of uh, basic types that you can use, and then you can compose any arbitrary complex data type. You can, you know, have inside there, you can use other messages. And so the nice thing um, at compile time, what happens is it takes this message, it reads it, and it generates code for you, uh, C++ code or Python code or whatever. And it puts it in the appropriate place, at least makes you believe that it's there. And basically implements the serialization and deserialization in here. It has them implemented for all the basic types. And so as you compose, it will just, just take care of these things. It's very nice. So let's see how, how they would communicate. Um, as you see on top, I have included the message that I just generated. It has a data file and a string. And um, this is, you know, almost the most simplest process that you can imagine in the <coughs> Hello World. You have these, um, you include the ROS header file, you call an init, which is, which does the, the handshake with the master. Um, and in this particular case, this process, all it has to do is to publish a counter and hello world. Okay, so what it does, it, it advertises. In the advertising process, it basically tells the master, hey, um, I have a info topic and it is of type my package, my data. And take, use a buffer of a thousand, um, meaning if, if this number would be one, I would always overwrite the last message. Now, if people really need, they can have the last thousand. Um, and so all this program does, so in this case, the ROS core um, gets to know this. And when I call publish, so all we do here is we take a message and we fill the, we fill the member variables and we publish it. Um, if you ask what the spin once is, spin once is basically a thread that takes that memory and actually does the, the shipping it. So this is, these are the few things that you will encounter every so often is, is um, it has to do with the spinner. So if you, if messages don't get published, keep in mind uh, Google for spinning or spinner, raw spinner. 
Okay. And so the way the other processes get to know uh, what you're talking about is basically they uh, basically just subscribe. Mm -hmm. The way subscribing is uh, implemented is using callbacks. So you, you specify a function name that has this message as a, a parameter. And then whenever this node publishes a particular um, um, message, then this function will be called by the spinner of this process. And then you can use this function in the, uh, the, the message in the way you wanted to use it. So important here is that um, the ROS core is only navigating the naming, just doing the naming service. There's no data going through the ROS core. So once they know about each other, they ne negotiate the, uh, the, you know, data rate and whatnot, uh, the, 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 the protocol, and then they directly send messages. And nice is also that, that one node can publish and multiple nodes can receive. And the same way around, another node can go ahead, advertise, and subscribe. And you can easily build a system where every process talks and receives and makes it very complicated. So be very careful with these things. OK, now, as I mentioned, um, we need logging. We need to know if there's one process, you know, maybe a printf does it. If you have a um, typical example would be um, if you, if you, how do you say? I'm not sure whether it's true, but let's say if you have a program that has um, processed some input and generates some output. If you debug it, at some point it just works, right? If you, for example, has to concatenate strings or tokenize strings, it will just work. You tested all the edge cases and this thing is correct. Now, the moment you deal with a robot, it has sensor info, it has, you know, sensor information. Sensor information is always noisy. Um, there are, you cannot test all the cases. So you might think that your face detector is working, but it will only work in 80% or 90% of the time. So it's very important that if along the lines something doesn't work. Oh. Okay, I'm sorry, I have to do what exactly? Okay, give me a second. And okay. Yes, so it's important that once your algorithm runs and for whatever reason the face is not detected or it detected a face on, on top of a car, you need to be able to kind of go back and, and see what happened. So it's always beneficial if you not just process sensor data, but for example, also log all the sensor data. Besides sensor data, you might need to debug your system and, and you want to log these, these topics to kind of basically backtrack which message was sent or what was the content of this message. So it's really, that's, that's really a, an important part. Or for example, if you, um, what's very nice and very important is uh, you can just have your system, uh, your, your sensor generate a bunch of images or you know, record a bunch of data and then you can log them and then you can you know, go home and work on this data set by itself, you don't have to sit in front of the robot. So you can just replay the log data and your code thinks that it's sitting in front of the computer and the robot, make sense? So the way it works in, in ROS is you write them into, into back files. So all it does is you can specify which topics you should be recording and then you record them. This is called uh, ROS back. And, and and Jeremy, who was uh, who actually got uh, I'm Jeremy Liebs. I'm a software engineer at Willow Garage, and I'm going to talk to you about logging and playback tools for ROS. Logging and playback are important features that are built directly into ROS. Whether you're a researcher collecting data sets, a developer testing algorithms, or a hardware engineer collecting diagnostics data, ROS enables you to capture data from any part of the system, save it to a file, and then replay it at a later date. 
In ROS, we call these files bag files, and we have a variety of tools to help you manage them. The ROS bag tool lets you record data from any ROS topic, as well as play it back into the running ROS system. We also have the graphical tool RxBag, which lets you visually examine bag files. You can scan back and forth through the data and see plots, camera images, and raw messages. There are a variety of other tools for filtering, extracting, and updating bag files as well. We've already seen numerous interesting applications, such as sending bag files to Amazon's Mechanical Turk service for data set labeling. The ROS bag and RxBag tools come with ROS, and you can find the documentation and tutorials on ROS.org. Just as a side note, Jeremy was a master's student at USC. Um, I have talked to many people that try to re-implement or implement their own ROS system, ROPAP operating system, all the other ones. Um, and whenever I talked to them, they were able to kind of replicate most of the functionality of ROS, but they scratched their head always to kind of how do we get this, this back file system to work. And that's something that's really useful. Um, next thing is device drivers. A very painful and annoying thing um, for those that know. There's no, if, if you get a new, a new piece of hardware and you have to make it, you know, talk to you and read, there's no price to be won. It just has to work and has to be robust and you will not get a paper or any publication out of this and people spend a lot of time. Uh, so interesting was, you know, some time ago there was the Kinect and uh, the good thing now is there, was, there were tons of Kinect demos and, 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 and whatnot. And the nice thing that Ross really provided there was that someone put, some very few people looked at how these device drivers work, put them online, even such that Microsoft at some point uh, released their own drivers. Um, and everyone was just taking it and looking at the message as the interface and was able to use it. Um, yeah, I think this was one of the labs. There were everyone has seen a Kinect and knows what it does and all these things. Good. Um, the next thing is is calibration, meaning um, so you have a robot, okay, and in order to make it to, to be able to use this with ROS, you will have to specify somewhere how your robot looks like, what your robot is, and and and, and for example, if you have a uh, it, how many links it has in, in terms of, um, how do I say this? Yeah, you have to specify the number of joins, the, the type of the joins, the number of links, and how long these links are, and, and, and so on and so forth. And um, this, this is handled in ROS by URDF, Universal, Universal Robot, Robot Description Format. Format. The, the idea is that, that um, there's a whole set of tools that, for example, visualize the robot, and they speak this language. language. And what, what you, you have, have to do is you, you have to, to to sit there and there are tools to generate you these URDFs, but it's still, uh, you know, cumbersome. And I mean, the reason for that is, is again, it's, um, it's a standard so that if my friend in Italy builds a robot and I want to work with it, he can just send me this URDF and my program will understand um, the, you know, the coordinate transforms and, and whatever it has to do. So the problem is, the moment you put a connect or a sensor anywhere, as I mentioned before, is you will need calibration. And um, everyone knows exactly what calibration is. Yes, no, hands up. Who knows about calibration? Okay. I thought so. Um, well, I'm just, just, just in one, one, one sentence, sentence or two, two. is if, if you have a sensor, sensor it's unfortunately always such or mostly such that, that unless it's already calibrated, calibrated that the values that you get are not exactly the values that the sensor is supposed to measure. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a camera and you put it on a robot, even if you think you know exactly where this camera mm -hmm. is, you might be off by a couple of millimeters by an angle and so what calibration does is goes through a procedure that looks at, for example, different poses and tries to infer from, from where it has seen and where it should see certain things to where, how this last transform looks like. There's calibrations for the intrinsics and extrinsics. And, you know, if you have a force torque sensor, you may want to 
calibrate by pushing on the table gently and say this is now you know one newton and this way you kind of change a few parameters so that the next time you measure something you're more certain about this measurement My name is Vijay Pradeep, and I'm a systems engineer at Willow Garage. The PR2 has a variety of sensors. The head alone has five cameras and a tilting laser, and each forearm has a camera as well. The PR2 becomes much less useful if these many sensors aren't calibrated to the rest of the robot. My goal is to make the calibration procedure as straightforward as possible, allowing researchers to tackle interesting research problems right from day one instead of spending weeks trying to get the system calibrated. We are currently calibrating the head cameras and tilting laser to the arm. During the calibration, the robot moves a small checkerboard through a variety of positions. The stereo cameras and tilting laser detect the checkerboard and can compare this data with the joint positions. This is all thrown into a large multi-step nonlinear optimization, which can be used to estimate the kinematic parameters of the stereo cameras, tilting laser, and arms. This system is fairly modular, so it's straightforward to add in more sensors, like the forearm cameras. And eventually, I'm hoping to extend this system to work on other robots as well. We hope that this calibration system will make the PR2 much easier to use. OK, now that that is covered, um, what about visualization? As I mentioned, visualization is very important. And what Ross provides you with is the robot visualizer, short Arvis. And that is something that is um, one reason to use ROS as well. And Josh Hi, I'm Josh Faust, a software engineer at Willow Garage, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Arviz, our 3D visualization environment. Arviz lets us view what the robot is seeing, thinking, and doing. Developing on a robot can be very difficult without knowing exactly what the robot thinks is going on in the world. Debugging by looking at numbers scrolling by is difficult enough in 2D. Unless you have an intuitive understanding of quaternions and coordinate frames, debugging 3D by numbers alone is not much fun. Arviz lets you look at the world through the robot's eyes, whether those eyes are cameras, lasers, or joint encoders. There are two main ways of putting data inside Arviz's world. First, Arviz understands sensor and state information like laser scans, point clouds, cameras, and coordinate frames. These have specialized displays that let you configure how you'd like to view that information. Second, we have visualization markers that let you as a programmer send primitives like cubes, arrows, and lines, colored however you want. The combination of sensor data and custom visualization markers make Arviz a powerful tool for development of robot capabilities and research. The ROS navigation stack uses a combination of these to show its current path, obstacle data, 3D voxel grid, and topological map. Arviz markers have also been used by motion planning researchers to show planned versus actual paths, goals, object detection, and calibration. Arviz is a powerful tool for debugging robot applications. It's free, open source, and available now at ross.org. OK, just a shameless uh, self. Um, well, that's something I, I did just to show how I have been using the visualization. In this case, the robot was obviously trying to to unscrew a bottle, which is you know easy for us, but very challenging for a robot. And as you can see here, um, I was using it fairly extensively. It's it, as simple as it sounds. It's it's very complicated. Here, for example, you see the. Um, <coughs> <coughs> so what's very important is that that you understand what the robot is doing and the best way, at least as far as I know so far, is, is to visualize 
you know, say, robot, tell me what you know. And so this is, and this you overlay with the image of the robot. So you can also see immediately whether where the robot thinks objects are or its hand are is, is where it actually is. For example, this particular robot has a hand and it has strain gauges in the knuckles. And you can visualize how much torque it feels in the knuckles. You can visualize how much it should feel. You can see whether your controller does the right thing. You, you can visualize, visualize frames, frames where you one, one is the desired and one is the actual. You can see whether your controller tracks your object. You see on top in the wrist there are these arrows. So you can see how much the force should look, how much the force is, and whether your controller tracks it correctly and things like that. So there's lots of things going on and looking at scrolling numbers, um, the numbers scrolling down the screen is kind of very difficult, but here you have a fairly intuitive and easy way to go, easy understanding. The same is um, in Arvis, you can, again, visualize point clouds, very important. So you can see whether the point clouds and where you think the green the object, object is, um, is, you know, you know fit. In this, in this case, case, we had to take a wheel off and, and put it down. down. You, you see whether, whether the forces that you measure in your force, force control loop are, are, are correct, whether, whether you have to calibrate it. it. There's, There's a lot of stuff that's going, going on, and, and Arvis basically just, just easily allows you to, to visualize that. that. And Arvis does it by... Yes? Is this only for the no. no, so, so a, good a good question. question. Um, Arvis is, is nothing but you know, another process that reads the messages on the topics, topics and visualizes them, okay? okay. So, so imagine, imagine if I want to publish this coordinate frame here, right? right? There's, There's a process that has to send a message and then it specifies a position and an orientation and then Arvis goes ahead and draws this where you want things to draw, uh, where, you, where you have it to draw. Uh, you know, no, your face detection algorithm basically would send a message that says, I detected a face at image X, Y, or in, in this in this location, and an Arvis would write for you. In the same, Arvis has a lot of um, <coughs> messages that it already knows about. For example, the point clouds that you see here, the, the little dots, those are from the Kinect. Uh, talking about perception, ROS does not come with OpenCV, but it's like big, you know, like uh, I guess you have heard about OpenCV. Um, there are ROS bridges that allow you to easily use OpenCV inside ROS processes. Similarly, ROS doesn't come with PCL, but PCL is a point cloud library. Um, you know, when I talked about robots in general and how to program, the same applies to uh, 3D sensors. They provide you with, yes? Um, before PCL, I think there is already OpenGL, right? Like, can you compare between OpenGL and PCL? Uh, there, there are different, different things. things. Good question. Um, so, so PCL is a library. Okay, okay since Kinect, um, people realize that or there are more and more 3D sensors coming. 3D sensors means obviously you don't have an X and Y value, but you also have a, a depth information. So you have these point clouds. And now if you want to find a table in this point cloud, you find a plane that has lots of matching points. So this is, for example, one, one point that if, if you have a robot running around, detecting planes is a good thing. You know where a floor is, you know where a wall is. And now this is exactly one of these functions that everyone would have to implement. And so PCL is, is a library that allows you to process point clouds and allows you to detect planes, filter, do clustering, like all these basic operations that you may want to use if you process 3D data. Now, OpenGL is a, um, you know, a library that allows you to display 3D uh, information, like what you saw in Arvis. It allows you to render an object into an image. So it's, it's not quite the same. Um, here you see some examples of, um, of PCL. <coughs> In this case, for example, the green, it detects the plane, and it tells you these points belong to the plane, and these points belong to the object. It allows you, again, to visualize it and, and things like that. Okay, let's move on. Um, move on. Good point. Now, um, 
if you have a robot and your part is to detect faces, again, face detection is very important, you may want to have the robot to roam around, but you don't want to deal with the planning. And so for planning, there's guys like Renal that uh, write most Hi, planners. my name is Renal Kalakrishnan. I'm doing my PhD at the University of Southern California. This summer at Willow Garage, I've been working on algorithms that plan motions for the robot arm to move in cluttered spaces. We developed a new motion planner called STOMP, which stands for Stochastic Trajectory Optimization for Motion Planning. In the video, you'll see the PR2 using this planner as part of the grasping pipeline. The robot executes smooth motions that are collision-free and also satisfy constraints that the object should be held upright during the motion. STOMP is based on a trajectory-based reinforcement learning algorithm called PI-square, recently developed at USC. Collision-free parts are obtained by optimizing a cost function that penalizes collisions with the environment. Since the algorithm does not require gradients, we can also optimize secondary criteria, such as motor efforts and task constraints, like holding a glass of water upright. This algorithm will enable future robots to operate smoothly, efficiently, and for longer periods of time. For more details, check out the STOMP package on ROS.org. <coughs> OK. One, one last video. So um, one of the components that you may want to need is navigation. And Eitan will talk about that. Hi, my name is Eitan Marder Epstein, and I work at Willow Garage on autonomous navigation and mapping. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the open source navigation stack that we've released as 1.0. The navigation stack was designed with openness and cross-platform support in mind. This means that we hope you'll be able to use the navigation stack on anything from a platform as small as an iRobot Create to something as large and with as many sensors as a PR2. You can configure it to use different sensors, change the model or footprint of your robot, and use a three-dimensional or two-dimensional view of the world as needed for your application. In particular, the three-dimensional view of the world enables the robot to avoid obstacles like tables, chairs, and people's feet. This is a significant improvement over navigation stacks that view the world as purely planar. Overall, we tried to make the navigation stack as flexible as possible. We also included the ability to track unknown space in the world. This means that as your robot rounds a corner, it knows that the space around that corner is unseen. This allows the robot to slow down intelligently in situations where it needs to gain more knowledge about the world or its environment. The navigation stack is also now simultaneous localization and mapping friendly. This means that you can use your favorite SLAM system and hopefully with minor modifications plug it in to use Willow's open source navigation stack. If you don't have a SLAM system, you should check out the SLAM G mapping package as it provides one that already interfaces with the navigation stack and should be easy to use. Overall, that's the navigation stack. It's the same code that we use here at Willow on the PR2. It's the same code that allowed our robot to complete 26.2 miles of autonomous navigation for a Milestone 2 effort. You can check us out on ROS.org. All the code's open source, and you should feel free to download or use it as you like. OK. Now that we have uh, you know, all these packages, the challenge, what's called system integration, is how do you make them do something useful? Um, Let's say you have a robot, uh, in this case, the Atlas robot. And you want to make it do something, right? So this node 3 probably becomes your controller. That, that is, is what implements the PD control, control, the inverse dynamics, and whatnot. Now, on the other side, you have the perception node that has the sensors connected to it <coughs> that try to find, let's say, terrain maps and tries to kind of reason about the orientation of the base. And you have a, uh, yeah, so it, it figures out the pose of the robot and the terrain. And then you have a planning node, right, that given this information of the terrain and the pose of the robot, it basically, it probably comes up with footholds. How do you, where do I put my foot? And so all of them talk to each other. You know, this one sends the, the terrain and updates them. It, this guy receives the terrain map and tries to plan footsteps. And then the controller reads that information and tries to make the robot move this way. Now, the question of the day is, what, what is the problem here? Anyone, please. 
crossbow fails? Okay, there is uh, failure. Failure is not an option. Um, I would say, okay, the Roscoe fails, meaning it doesn't tell each node. Um, that is a, you know, a programmatic error that usually doesn't happen. I mean, obviously there's, you know, weird things can happen, but let's assume that all these nodes are able to talk to each other. Again, it doesn't go through the, uh, the ROS core, right? The ROS core just allows them to establish connection. So the way this diagram should be drawn is basically perception sends something to the controller, perception sends, uh, sorry, perception sends to the planner, the planner generates the plan and sends it to the controller and the controller realizes. So ROS core is not involved in that communication. But what is, what is a, a problem? What, what kind of problem will you, for those that have program <coughs> robots, what are, what are the issues? Network lag. Sorry? Network lag. Uh, yes, that, that is correct. I mean, if these are all on the same process, on the same computer, there's no network, right? They all go through sockets, um, no network lag, no issues with, with too many people logged in, in if you use wireless. But you're on the right track. I was just thinking limited hardware. I mean, if all of them have to communicate to each other simultaneously. Okay, I'll make it easier. How, let's assume that the hardware is good enough that in average, it will just work fine. Processing lag? You're, it's, we're make going <laughs> step for step very close. Um, processing lag, I just repeat. Let's assume that your processor is good enough to process in average, these points to generate footholds, and in average, from these footholds, to generate trajectories for the controller to be tracked. Device. Huh? Device. Yes, so I mentioned in average. Um, if you think about this humanoid robot, if one of these messages comes a little bit too late, if, if the IMU tells it, dude, you're falling, if the, uh, if the perception says there's a car coming, and I get this to know a little bit too late, then uh, bad things happen. So we need to make sure that there are time constraints, meaning <coughs> the real world doesn't wait. Okay, this is different from programming a web server. A web server, you know, if I have to wait a little longer for something to pop up, that's fine. As long as in average it does it, it's fine. In, in, if you have a real system, you need to know at all times with guarantees that you're not falling, that you're not there are, um, there are real time constraints. So I will be talking about real time for a moment. And this is um, a simplified version of what you would see if you draw a bunch of boxes. So you have your hardware, you have a Linux kernel or any kind of kernel if you use you know, Mac or anything, but let's assume it's Linux. And then you have your applications, these, these processes, okay? And let's assume all these processes that you just for, so, saw before are running in here, especially the controller, for example, okay? And now, you know, I go ahead and start Firefox. So the processor kicks in and says, oh, I'm now starting Firefox for a moment. And so the, the controller, the control loop gets, you know, swapped out for a moment and we use, and the robot will start to fall because it doesn't get a command. So we need to make sure that that the robot has a priority. We need to make sure that some processes have much higher priority than some other processes. And what the real-time operating system um, basically ensures are two things. First, it, um, it makes sure that there is no, I guess what you mentioned is processing lag. Um, so let's just say there's some activity, you know, this, 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 uh, the, the, the stick that you, appears, the obstacle. Um, the question is, once you see that, the, uh, there's an interrupt, it goes into the system, and the kernel tries to find the appropriate application to kind of get the appropriate response. So at some point, there's an inter event that happens, and the question is how long it takes, how long this response time takes in order to, to trigger the appropriate um, correction. <coughs> so first observation is real time doesn't mean fast, okay? So don't, don't get, get confused. confused. Real time means that you can ensure that in worst case, it will be happening within this time limit. You can make a real time system that says, oh, in, in you know, time limit is a day. 
But you know, no matter what happens, in within a day, your program will be obviously correct, but also will be has response. Um, usually, it means real-time operating system. Real-time systems are usually such that uh, there's a very um, tight schedule, like a control loop, when you have to send, you know, run a function a thousand times a second. And another important part that the real-time operating system provides you, and that is very useful for robots, is the task set scheduling. Um, think about if you have a couple of processes and you especially have a control loop, then this control loop may run at a kilohertz. So there's a, a, a periodic um, a, a function that is being called periodically. You know, in, in the controller, it would say, read your join angle data, um, read the desired, compute the torques, and send the torques. And this happens a thousand times a second. And so there's always a deadline that you have to meet. And this processing time can be slightly different, but this deadline is something. And, and the most important part is that real-time operating systems usually go and make it make everything deterministic. So if you think of, of all the operating systems that you know, they are usually optimized such that the, the throughput in average is the fastest. Um, now, in real-time operating system, it's such that it has a very simple round robin. Everyone gets a certain time slot, and there's no, no um, trying to give, you know, it's, it's boring and deterministic. But this way, you can uh, ensure that certain things happen in time. The operating system that we'll be talking about is, is just one way of doing it, and that's something that um, I've been using a lot, and people all over the place have I started using it as well. And the idea is uh, you have you know, no longer like the Linux kernel, but let's say a thin kernel that does one thing, is it takes the regular Linux and puts it into one of its processes, and then it allows you to specify real-time processes. Okay? Um, now, in here, you can specify a bunch of real-time tasks, like your control loop is one real-time task, and it will ensure that if you run it periodically, that it will happen within deadline. Now, what happens if I start my, my Firefox? Well, given that I'm running this, it will not happen until, until this guy says, okay, I'm done for this period. Then you will switch. The, the Firefox process gets a little bit of CPU time, starts to do its thing, and the thin kernel basically ensures that it preempts the entire Linux, so your mouse will not move for this moment and runs the real-time application. So this way, you can uh, nicely prioritize. There's uh, some some important things. There's some issues with uh, real-time programming is that you have to be very careful. If you if you make a mistake here, if you, for example, write a process that that really needs a lot of CPU and never finishes, it's processing time. That means all your CPUs are running your code, and Linux will never get anything to say anymore, so your mouse will freeze, your computer will freeze. That's it. You have to reboot, um, unless you have some tools and things. But that's, that's a problem. Now, you also have to be very careful in the type of functions you use. If you read from hard disk, if you allocate some memory, that is not handled in here. If you do these kind of things, it will necessarily have to go into the Linux mode. And then if it's in the Linux mode, it can get preempted. So then you can have a delay. So you have to be very careful by pre-allocating all the memory that you need. You cannot use you know, regular printf, because whenever you do these calls, system calls, your, your application will switch to what's called the secondary mode and end up in the Linux mode, where it can get preempted, and you lose real-time um, capabilities. And the same side is um, if you saw these processes talking to each other, the important part is that if I send this real-time um, task in here, a message that this interface doesn't break the real-time loop, okay? So in ROS, you have a bunch of packages that, um, that allow you to ensure that this control loop in real-time doesn't get violated, meaning it pre-allocates a bunch of data. It does a bunch of tricks. How about that? OK? So that's all I want to talk about uh, real-time and how ROS provides this. 
first of all, this this Roper is, is, is add on to the Linux, Linux kernel. kernel because Xenomai is not, has nothing, nothing to do with ROS. Okay, that, that is something that you will have to set up for a computer and then use ROS on top of it. Yes. yes. If you have multiple cores, can you just dedicate a core to each uh, partition? Um, it's, it's not, not as easy, easy unfortunately. Um, one example is. Um, you you have an application like the control loop, and necessarily you will have to allocate a bunch of memory, and this memory has to be, you know, optimally in the cache or in physical memory, because if you read that value, it's better better accessible. If um, it doesn't matter whether the processor is is free, you have to read this um, variable. Now, if it's not in this in the memory. It will have to do page swapping, meaning you have to read from this, which is very slow, and so then you lose your time constraints. So there's there's a a whole you know branch of research that goes into how to do this so that you you have real time um, guarantees. And just to make a point, um, it's troublesome to debug these kind of systems. Okay, um, just to talk about simulation. I like that video. So this is the same robot that you saw, but a, a simulated version of it. Um, this was actually the uh, DARPA virtual challenge, where um, where everyone was able to, was allowed to provide uh, to to participate. They had to do eight particular tasks. One is to uh, get into the car and start driving it. Another one would be climbing a ladder. Another one would be walking over difficult terrain. And uh, why I'm showing this is uh, first you see gazebo, so that's implemented in gazebo. If you if you happen to have a robot in your garage, gazebo is a, a good simulator that allows you to uh, get going on on programming robots. Now, why why did I show it particularly this? It's uh, it's because simulations are um, the way to go. <laughs> But the moment there are contacts involved, it's very difficult to to get them right. So you can do things in simulation that you never want to do with your robot in in uh, yeah. So you have to take simulation with the same grain of salt, and knowing that there's a mismatch between your simulation and the real system. There was also you know, a bunch of serious um, contributions that managed to have the robot walk. So, so the thing is, um, is designed by the programmer, or do um, the, the way, way this, this company, um was working is there was, um, I think, on Amazon or somewhere, there was a server, and it would run the simulation, and you would have to upload code that would use the API. Um, and the API doesn't, you, you can only basically read the sensor information from the robot, including similar connect data or, or perception data, and you get the chance to com command torques to the robot, and then the robot would, using the physics engine of the simulator, interact with the world, and hopefully you manage to, you know, pick up that, uh, the hose and, and plug it in. So, yeah, you write a whole bunch of code to generate a grasp and execute that grasp and test whether it succeeded. And um, just to maybe finish this, is the, the ones that were successful actually got provided with a very expensive Atlas robot, a real robot, and they got to compete in the what's called the DARPA um, DRC trials that happened in Miami in, in December. And so the, you can watch a bunch of uh, interesting videos online how these robots actually try to perform all of these tasks. Okay, closing up. Um, one one last thing is is that you will also see if you have a robot that tries to um, navigate and has sensors that allows you to detect bumps. All you you oftentimes end up uh, writing code that is equivalent to a state machine. It says, oh, if touched here, then you turn back and you turn right and you go in this direction. And 
Hi, I'm Jonathan Bourne, and I've been working on building systems that allow us to make the PRT robots perform complex tasks autonomously. This new system, SMASH, allows us to compose and coordinate primitive to complex robot capabilities into robust robot applications. When a system implemented with SMASH is running, both users and developers can actually get introspection to the current state of the system. While SMASH is a new library, it really focuses on old concepts like hierarchical concurrent state machines. Additionally, because it's implemented in Python, users don't need to learn a whole new language in order to use it. This is critically important for researchers who need to integrate sensing and control systems, but neither want to hack scripts together nor learn a complex task coordination language. Smash has given us a rapid and scalable executive architecture with which we have already implemented several new applications on the PR2 platform. For more information about and tutorials on how to use Smash, that's S-M-A-C-H, check out smash on ross.org. Okay, to last video this time for real. Maybe no one more. I don't know. Um, just just a, a fun last example where um, when I was at Willow, they hi, I'm a member of the Willow Garage Pool Shark team, and we just programmed the PR2 to play pool. At Willow Garage, we like to challenge our raw software by doing short hackathon sprints. These sprints help spark new ideas, test our raw software, and most importantly, are fun. <laughs> Our most recent sprint was a game of pool with the PR2. This required tackling several different problems at once. In order to get the PR2 to use a pool stick, we built a special grip and bridge so that the PR2 could use its wrist to power the stick. Two other challenges were finding the ball and localizing the table. To find the balls, we used the high resolution camera with a color blob tracker, as well as a casino set of billiard balls that were easier to track. To locate the table, we used corner detectors, to find the diamonds on the edge of the table and use the bottom laser sensor with AMCL to detect the legs of the table. Once the PR2 knew where the balls and table were, we could pass that information to our shop planner. We used FastFizz, open source pool physics library by Alone Altman, to check the results of our planned shots before executing them. We began our pool playing sprint on Monday morning. By Friday afternoon, the PR2 was successfully pocketing shots. It even surprised us by making some fairly long shots, as well as shots from difficult angles. While there's definitely more to improve, our team is excited to see how much can be accomplished in just one week. All our code is available on ross.org in the billiard stack. OK. Um, I'm wrapping up. I have talked about a whole bunch of things. Uh, nothing too deep. I hope I, at some point, just made you a little bit excited about um, Bud Ross, and I hope you get a little bit interested to download a few code samples and get going. I've heard you have a project, or at least some of you have a project. You don't have to use Ross, but it's, I, I recommend. <coughs> um, I showed you a whole bunch of tools. There's, there's uh, a lot more to say. Now, just to finish up, um, there's a the good reason about ROS is this way it really you, you're part of community and you share and, and, and distribute code and other people can use it and you know we can make process in uh, progress in robotics. There are a few more links um, that help you to um, get more info about ROS. I will provide the slides in a bit later today, so you can you don't have to write down everything. And that's it. Thank you.